It's a pleasure to see you all here uh, today. I wanted to share some ideas with you from a book that I recently wrote around digital change. Uh, it's called The Content Trap, uh, which I hope might be somewhat beneficial to all of you trying to affect change in online education or higher education. Uh, the premise of the book is pretty simple, uh, that we have a lot to learn from digital efforts that have taken place in other parts of the economy. And I'm going to focus most of my remarks on what's happened in digital media, which it turns out has been experiencing this for 25 years. The second reason I wrote the book is that much of the narrative of what we have come to believe about what's happened in that part of the space is essentially wrong. Uh, along the way, the book became a personal journey. When I started writing the book, I was asked around the same time to come in and lead our digital learning efforts at Harvard Business School, which is now called HBX. Uh, so I'll spend some of my remarks talking about at least how some of these ideas shaped our particular thinking. All right, uh, does anyone know what this is? Well, there's a clue from the title. <laughs> this is Newsprint. And there's a very interesting question to be asked about what happens to rooms like this 10 years from now. Uh, one of the things that I'll stay away from is predictions, since we're pretty bad at making predictions in general. Uh, but the problem is ostensibly clear, right? Which is online news is in many ways simply a better product. There's real-time updating. You can access it anytime, anywhere. There's more variety in terms of content, rich media formats. Uh, it's interactive, it's personalized, and for the most part, free. You can keep adding features to this product every year, like virtual reality and so on, but that's essentially what we're competing against as a newspaper. How fast are readers moving online? So this is the data on circulation per household over time, uh, which is pretty stunning. What is probably also surprising, and you might have noticed by now, is that I actually don't have the time axis on the slide. <laughs> Um, but you might guess sort of when the internet kicks in, and you know, typically our guess is all the way to the left, which turns out to be exactly wrong. <clears throat> so this decline starts about 70 years ago with radio, then black and white TV, then color TV, cable news, 24 by 7 cable news, and then the internet. By the way, the impact of the internet is empirically indistinguishable from the 70 years of technology that came before it. And yet we hear all the stories essentially saying that newspapers kill the internet, in, the internet kill newspapers. Why is that? Uh, it turns out, as we know by now, the problem was actually somewhat different. If you look at the red line at the top, that's circulation revenues for US newspapers over the last 20 years. So declines per household were offset by higher prices for newspapers. Circulation revenues actually more or less stable. Retail advertising dropped by about 30%. But what really killed newspapers was classified advertising, which has dropped by about 90%. Now, on the face of it, this is, uh, still leaves a puzzle, which is online classifieds has many of the same features as online news. It's real time, rich media, anytime, anywhere, variety, you can personalize, search, and so on. And yet, the declines in newspaper circulation were small, relatively small whereas the declines in classifieds are massive. And so what's going on? Uh, this gets to uh, my first uh, point of the day. And this is really a digital metaphor. It has to do with consumer behavior. It has to do with how we consume news versus classifieds. And that simple observation has pretty profound implications for everything we do. So what's the difference? Well, we, news fundamentally is made in the hub we produce news, and then we distribute and deliver it to people who consume in the spokes. When we think about, you can think of that as a hub and spoke model. When we think about the impact of digital, our first recognition was what digital does is it increases the number of spokes dramatically, and therefore increases reach. That's only the tip of the iceberg. That's in some sense phase one. What we then realized is, hold on a second, the spokes can actually talk back to us. So we can listen to them, we can hear from them, this gives rise to data and interactivity and so on. But really, phase three has to do with something more fundamental, which really, in this case, is how we consume something like a classified product. 
Whereas for news, you and I make the decision of which news site to go to based on product quality, price, and other features. When it comes to online classifieds, the decision of which site we go to is made very simply. We go to the site where there's the most listings. And where do people list? They go to the site where there's the most buyers. More buyers, more sellers, more sellers, more buyers. This gives rise to something that we call network effects or connected products. And this simple observation, again, has profound implications. Because what it says is digital really is not just about increasing reach. It's about connectedness. It's striking that after 25 years, most media organizations are still stuck in phase one, which is thinking about digital as increasing reach. This, I think, really has a lot to do with how we think about online education and where it's going to go forward. Uh, connectedness, as we also now know, is really the underpinning of all the digital giants, from Facebook to Amazon and so on. You might be asking the question, how can media firms in this case benefit from it? There's a company in Norway called Shipstead, which uh, many of you probably haven't heard of. It's generally regarded as one of the most successful companies in the Western world to make the transition online. Here's what they did. They first recognized the problem in classifieds. They go aggressively online. They win classifieds in Norway. 95% market share in real estate, jobs, and by the way, 115% market share in cars is what they list on their annual report. When I read this, I went to them and I said, I know you guys are smart. You're not that smart. Market shares do have to add up to 100%. They said, no, the site is so liquid that people in Denmark, Finland, and Germany are listing their cars on the Norwegian sites. So there's more cars sold there than there are cars in Norway. They make massive amounts of money because they charge 50 bucks a listing. They never thought that online classifieds would more than compensate for print revenue. They never thought this. They then expand from Norway to Sweden to France. Today, they're globally number one in classifieds, and it's a money machine. What's more interesting, though, is how this philosophy infiltrates the newsroom. I'll just share a story with you. This was the volcanic ash crisis, some of you may rem remember, which started in Iceland. I'm not going to pronounce the name of that volcano. Uh, spreads over Norway. What were the most popular stories during this crisis for them? You might venture to guess it probably has something to do with the health implications, weather patterns, when is this thing going to fly over, the geological formations that gave rise to the, the, the volcanic eruption, might this happen again. All plausible stories, but this had nothing to do with what their most popular stories were. What they noticed early on is that people were simply posting messages on their sites. All air travel had been disrupted in Norway, and the question people were asking is, how do I get from point A to point B? And you started seeing other people respond, oh, I'm traveling from Oslo to Trondheim. I can pick up three people at the train station at 3 o'clock. Come join me. They went to their IT team, and they asked them to build an app, which they did within seven hours, called Hitchhiker Central, whose only function was to allow people to connect. The question they asked themselves was this question, how can we help readers help each other? This is the idea of connecting the spokes. This has become the question they ask themselves during every major news crisis. By the way, it turns out this was the most popular quote-unquote content during the crisis in all of Europe. Everyone is using this. That's story number one, which is digital is not about reach. It's about engagement and connectedness. Story number two, this is music. This makes newspapers look like a growing industry. We all know what happened here. Napster uh, launches at the end of 99. Six months later, you start seeing CD declines. This was essentially piracy which killed the industry. Or at least that's the story we've been told. What's an alternative story? An alternative story is that this was simply a format change from CDs to digital formats. Uh, by the way, if that story were true, we can actually test it because there have been previous format changes within the industry. So we went out and collected the data on what happened when we moved from vinyl to cassette and cassette to CDs, just to see how rapid the declines were, to compare it to this uh, change, and that's what you find. Now, this is somewhat sobering, right? Because, by the way, even the squiggly lines look similar across the three charts. Uh, because if you think this is about file sharing and piracy, the right strategic response is, let's get as many lawyers in the room as possible. By the way, getting lawyers is not a bad thing if you've diagnosed the problem correctly. Uh, more challenging is, if this is simply a format change, the only question I have to ask is, where's the value in this new format? Uh, it turns out there's a lot of value from MP3 players and hardware to broadband internet access demand, which exploded just as file sharing was taking off, to, most interestingly, for the recording studios, live events, concerts. This is from Alan Kruger. 
who was showing that the price of live events more or less tracked the rate of inflation till about the mid to late 90s, just as file sharing takes off, the price of concerts explodes. Oh, it's interesting. 30 years ago, concerts were priced cheaply because they were the advertisement for you and me to go and buy the CD. Now that we can't control the price of music, that relationship flips. Free content is the advertisement for you and me to go to the live concert, which we can't pirate. By the way, artists actually uh, like this. This is partly why you see Radiohead and Shaka Shakira and Beyonce sort of saying when, when they asked about piracy, we sort of don't care. Uh, the tragedy is 1999, Universal Music sells its live events business. Why? Because the idea was let's focus on what we do best, which is the CD business. The idea of focus and core competence goes exactly against what you should be doing when value starts migrating elsewhere. And this is something pretty fundamental. So the value is not in content per se, it's in what we might call complements. The black line is CD sales. When you add in together just on this, digital formats, not including subscription-based streaming, broadband, uh, concerts, and MP3 players, the industry has never been in better shape. It's just that value got redistributed. Uh, complements. A complement is anything where the availability of the complement increases demand for your product. Just keep that in mind. We see this, by the way, everywhere. Hot dogs and ketchup, hardware and software. Think about a tire company that tells you where the best gourmet restaurants are. By the logic of core competence, Michelin's manager should, be, should have been fired. Oh, except that they tell you about these restaurants 300 miles away. And so you have to drive. Uh, theaters, increasingly, are making money not off the movies themselves. Some are offering childcare services right next door and charging market prices for that, and demand for movie going actually explodes. So this is not about content, it's about experience. Uh, by the way, this is the strategy of all the digital giants. Just to put this in perspective, if you look at the amount of money in the center versus the outer periphery, in the outer periphery, about two to three trillion dollars of value created in the last 10 years. Uh, so we like to say content is king. Um, I often think of that as a well, ill-defined axiom. It's not content is king, scarce content is king. But even if you believe that content is king, compliments are the emperor. So where do we see this? We thought the Kindle revolutionized e-reading. Why? Because longer battery life, beautiful reading formats, a lot of books to choose from, except the Sony reader came out a year and a half before the Kindle and sort of went nowhere. Even though the reading format was similar, number of books was similar, price was similar, the real revolution was wireless. For the Sony e-reader, I had to download the book onto my computer and then with a wire actually transfer it to the e-reader. The innovation of the Kindle had nothing to do with e-reading. It had mostly to do with e-purchasing. Again, if I thought about this as the product or content for e-reading, I'd basically be barking up the wrong tree. Uh, Cable operators often ask the question, how is it that we're losing share when we have faster pipes and a better product? That's the question you'd ask if you framed this around content, except there's all these other things that affect the customer experience. By the way, I have to confess, I was a bit surprised when I was looking at net promoter scores for cable companies. I didn't realize these could actually be negative. Um, <clears throat> compliments are everywhere. These are examples I got from my online students. Um, one that hit home personally, dogs and carpet cleaners. When you get a dog, you should get a lifetime sub subscription for carpet cleaners. They should sell these two things simultaneously. It's not about just getting the dog. All right. Uh, compliments can be affected by managerial choice. Meaning, if I put the same content in the digital format as the analog format, I'm essentially telling you as the customer, treat these as substitutes. Now, you might be thinking, what does a complementary product look like? So think about this in the context of TV. One of my favorite examples is fantasy sports. So my nephew and uh, millions of other people are playing fantasy football. Oh, it turns out when they start playing, they actually watch more live sports on TV. Why? Because I want to track those games where all my players are playing. I watch not just my local team, I watch all the 30 teams around the league. I'm watching blowouts. Uh, this is the best thing that happened to the NFL and they had nothing to do with it. But they set up a channel called the Red Zone where you and I can get 
uh, live scoring event streaming. They charge five bucks a subscriber, and this is a money machine. I was giving this example a few months ago. John Kosner from ESPN came to me and said, we actually just, just did something similar for one of our TV shows, The Bachelor. It's, uh, it's not an uplifting story, I will confess. Uh, his team essentially creates a fantasy bachelor where people are guessing who gets kicked off at the end of the episode, who gets the rose, and so on, and you see exactly the same thing happen, which is TV watching actually goes up. So this is not about uh, content. It's about the experience. It's not about digital versus analog. It's about complementarity. That's story number two. My last story Coming back to Shipstead, this is its strategy online. They were fast. They separated digital from print. They were free. They did everything that Clay Christensen, my colleague, would tell you to do. Except before you go out and call your teams and say this is exactly what we should do, just pause a second. Uh, here's a different company, The Economist. We're all familiar with it. They were slow. They were so slow, they didn't even register their domain name in time. For 15 years, if you typed in theeconomist.com, you saw a photo of Alan Greenspan. He was faster. They never separated digital from print. They were paid, no links to others, and guess what? This is one of the most successful magazines in the last 15 years. How do we reconcile this? Well, fundamentally, they have different value propositions to their customers. It's not just we're in the content business. If Shipstead's about breaking news, The Economist is about escaping breaking news. It's about coming to us to get the perspective about what's happening in the world every week. And our temptation is often to look at these choices row by row to think of them as best practices, whereas really we should be looking at these choices column by column. It's not about a best practice, it's about strategy. Context matters, something as simple as that. So when you ask your customers or online learners what is it you care about, they might tell you 50 different things. And if you try and optimize on all of them, there is pretty much no chance you will succeed. Choose the three that really matter to them, and then go and benchmark on those three attributes. Uh, this goes back to strategy 101, right? Success is about saying no. All right, so this, was, uh, this is essentially the book. Uh, by the way, I have to say it's a 350-page book, but I've tried to summarize it in 20 minutes. Uh, so I'm writing this book, and meanwhile, uh, we're thinking about what we do when the tsunami of online hits higher education. This is our classroom at Harvard Business School. It's a case method classroom. We have conversation around real world cases. The first thing we realized is if you simply put a camera in the classroom and stream this online, it's not gonna be a particularly inspiring mode or offering for the online learners. We said we have to be digital first. So we ruled out simply streaming what's in the classroom. The second is we look at online and we say, there's 3,000 organizations and universities trying to go online. What gives us a license to play or to win? And the one thing we do have going for us is uh, we've sort of had a 100-year leadership in residential business education, partly because of the case method. We feel we do it pretty well. So the question we were asking is, can we leverage something about the case method and take it online? We were very reductionist. We said, let's actually boil it down to the core principles of case method and try and see whether we can reimagine those principles online. Uh, so that's what we did. By the way, this is a fundamental trade-off also that almost every online organization in higher ed, I think, faces, which is it's very easy to stream what happens in the classroom at low cost, and you get massive reach, hundreds of thousands of people taking the courses. What's the challenge? Lower engagement, 1%, 3% completion rates. Oh, then we have a lot of organizations that go the other extreme and say, let's actually optimize for digital. Let's have value-added interaction between the content experts and the learners. And so we have these beautiful platforms that arise where the faculty can speak to up to 15 or 19 learners at a time. Engagement's super high. The challenge is we can't scale because fa faculty are now the bottleneck. And so the question we were trying to ask is how do we crack this trade-off between reach and engagement? Uh, when we started down this path, we thought of three principles, real-world problem solving, meaning start with the problem, not with the theory, and then inductively back into the theory. The second is active learning. Everyone in our classroom is at the edge of the seats, right? They can be cold-called at any time, all in, no one's a tourist. 
The third is peer-to-peer -peer learning or conversation. So we start going down this path. We're building these platforms. We take three courses. We start building them over three months. I had three MBA students working with me at the time. And over three months, they kept telling me, Professor Han, we don't just learn from the faculty. We learn from each other. We learn outside the classroom, in study groups, in the lunch corridors, in the gym conversations. After three months, I realized they had been saying something which we hadn't been listening to. By the way, here's what's really scary about this. We had spent three months creating the best platform with the best content, and we were falling into the very damn trap that I was writing about. This is how insidious it is. We pivoted the project completely, started focusing on social learning and taking it seriously, and asking the question, what would that platform look like? Uh, just to give you a glimpse of what it is, here's the first page on the platform. There's no content. It's essentially a global map. Uh, you can just see profile pictures of each other, pulsating bubbles that tells you who's on, and you can message them directly. The first day we launched this, we had 300 learners, 13,000 profile views. All they want to do is just check each other out. The content is secondary. <laughs> All right, so obviously we're creating these courses along the way. Um, we ask them questions, and the, the polls are being updated in real time to, again, get a sense of community. Uh, shared reflections, when you answer your question, you can see what others are writing. Uh, discussion boards, which often fail in online courses. Why? It's not searchable, it's not fun, there's no incentives to help each other. So we actually took each of these problems and tried to break it down. Uh, on incentives, one of the things we thought about is, why do people speak in our classrooms? Oh, we actually factor class participation into the course grade. It's 50% of our typical course grade in our classrooms. So what we did is, you know, crazy idea. We said, let's tell the students online that part of your grade depends on the extent to which you help each other out. That's all we said. We didn't say 10%, 30%. So we were intentionally obfuscating. The first day, 75% of the learners moved to the discussion boards. Now, of course, you're probably asking, but what happens if they answer the wrong question or answer it incorrectly? We were pretty nervous about this as well. We had our content teams on standby, ready to jump in the moment a discussion went off thread. For the first three weeks, the number of times we had to jump in was exactly zero. The questions were accurately, correctly, precisely answered by the peer group, many of whom are taking the courses for the first time. Uh, for assignment questions, rather than having text-based answers, which again are very hard to search, here's a simple question we asked them. You know, tell us examples of compliments, but the way you do it is just upload a picture that best describes your answer. And then we have it in sort of this Instagram-like post. People can literally, through a second, search what everyone else is offering. There was one idea that was inspired by the classroom, the online cold call. Here's the way it works. You're going through the course. Suddenly, at random, a pop-up appears. And it says, Heather, you've been cold called. You have a minute to answer this question. There's a clock ticking in the corner, counting down the time. 30 words or less. Your answer is visible to everyone in the cohort with your profile picture. Students get a little scared and a little more engaged. Uh, so these are some of the ways that we're just trying to build out the online platform. Uh, it turns out engagement scores were off the charts. I mean, they're literally comparable to the residential engagement scores that we see on campus. Uh, the sense of community actually turns out to be fundamental to their experience, not just the content. And coming back to that question I asked about how do you trade off reach versus engagement, for us the answer was not live faculty interaction, because that doesn't scale, painstakingly creating these courses over nine months. But once they start, I want no live faculty interaction. That's where peer learning kicks in, and the crowd takes over, essentially. Uh, by the way, it's very humbling. You realize they don't need us. Uh, all they need us to do is give them sort of the garden. Here's the fruit. Here's the order in which you might pick the fruit. And then, you know, do it the way you want to do it, learning by mistakes, learning from each other. Here are the learning outcomes uh, for three of the first courses we launched, which is after 11 weeks, people who've had uh, four-year majors in these subjects look not that different from people who've had no experience in these subjects when they start. Uh, we have about 85% completion rates for these courses. 
with, uh, with no live uh, interaction. Here's the geography um, of the peer-to-peer -peer conversations. This gave rise to things we were pretty surprised by, which is physical meetups that people are forming around the world. Who's taking HBX in Tokyo, Atlanta, Mumbai? Uh, so one of the things we thought about last year is maybe we can trigger community building to the next level because they know each other in their cohort of 300 pretty well. We've had about 15,000 learners go through now. We said, why don't we try and connect them to each other? We sent an email to them and said, if every, anyone would like to come to campus for a date, just meet each other, uh, please do so. We earmarked a particular date. Uh, 375 people showed up last year. We did the same uh, this year, in fact, two days ago, just on Saturday. 450 showed up. They came from Australia, Kenya, Denmark, India, Qatar for one day. By the way, they have nothing to gain from us at this point. They already have the certificate. This was just to connect with each other. Uh, this sort of starts sort of pushing your mind around what's possible with multi-platform education, meaning not either online or residential, to the extent we now have flexibility with two platforms where you can both get the residential experience and online. Maybe some will have 90% residential, 10% online. For others, it might be exactly the opposite. 90% online, 10% residential. Um, I'll talk about this tomorrow, which is a very different classroom called HBX Live, which is about synchronous conversation. We have a demo in the, in the ballroom where you'll actually experience this live. Uh, instead of 60 physical seats, you have 60 TV screens, and you can essentially run case discussions with people around the world. So just to step back and reflect, uh, what have we learned from HPX uh, that I wanted to share with you? One strategy matters. Uh, we spent about three months really trying to think through what we want to do. I would say those were the best three months we spent uh, on HPX. The second, the content trap, I think is more insidious than even I thought. Third, uh, connectedness or social learning in this case is really powerful, allowing highly engaging learning outcomes uh, to be experienced even at scale and without live faculty members. And last, as I said, this is the fundamental trade-off, I think, in online education between reach and engagement. Again, there's no one right answer, but how you crack that code is really the holy grail. Uh, these are the questions we often hear in online education, in my view, which is, Let's try and make the best content from the best faculty with the best courses. We often hear this debate about is online better or worse than residential and which will win in the end game. And we often hear statements like fill in the blanks, dash, 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 is the most effective approach in online education. I would submit that these three questions are more or less wrong uh, because they focus on content essentially not on connectedness. Thank you so much. <clears throat>